sorry about the parking. We, uh, this is scheduled on the the most difficult parking you can imagine. The rain and then the crack boils gain about five o'clock. So when you, when you leave, the parking's going to be even worse, but you just don't care if you be going in the other direction. So uh, I'd like to do what you all here today and to introduce Heyman. Heyman's been in, in my group since uh, 2008. He joined us in 2007 from Shreve University in Iran. And uh, he's been a pretty tumultuous time for my group over the last few years, what with the rise of SDM and open soil. Um, but when Heyman joined me, he, he gave me and said uh, you know, he had a pretty strong theory background, as many of us who do come from the group, and uh, said, I want to work on things that have an immediate practical value. And uh, I want to be involved in something that has a really mathematical basis and then direct application to practice. And that's really where this topic came from that he's going to be talking about today. So it was, uh, we, were, we were lucky, and it was a victory uh, to him that he was able to identify something I'm going to leave it to him before, before he starts. Let me just tell you a little bit about how the rules work. I think there's a few people here who maybe haven't been to a standard defense before. Um, embedded in the room here are five uh, examiners. <laughs> and uh, most of sitting in front of here. And uh, the, the, the first roughly one hour is an open public session. And um, we ask that you, where possible, hold questions to the end. Um, just to let the table make progress. Now, if you've got a burning question that you just cannot possibly move forward without knowing the answer to it, by all means, uh, by all means ask. But generally, it's better to leave it to the end. And then, um, after some questions, we will ask you to leave, and then there will be a closed session when we get to grow with Cayman and Arthur. Maybe we'll speak here as the chair, so at that point, he's going to take over and he'll be in charge. Thanks. Thank you, Nick, for the introduction, and uh, welcome everyone uh, to this uh, talk. So the topic of my uh, thesis talk is Heather Space Analysis, which I will show you during the talk uh, is an abstraction model uh, for common functionality of networking boxes that enable us to verify important properties about the network. It's not unusual to see new headlines like this almost every uh, week in the news. Uh, that an outage in the network that we use every day causes some uh, problem in our day-to-day -day activity. In this case, uh, a spring network outage as a result of a fiber cut uh, resulted in delay for as and passengers, or in the case of this other news, a uh, level 3 outage as a result of a, a software bug in Juniper routers resulted in uh, some major internet issues. But even in the network that we use every day, uh, we see uh, examples like this. Like two months ago, we received this email on Gates uh, building mailing list that says uh, between uh, 6.20 and 7, we experienced a complete network outage in the building when a loop was created uh, by some staff members. And many examples like this that all shows that ensuring functional correctness of network is a complex task. In fact, even simple questions are hard to answer. Questions such as, can host state talk to host B? Or, what are all packet headers from A that can reach to B? Or, if A can talk to B, where the packets are dropped? Or, what will happen if I remove an entry from a router? Or, are two slices of network isolated from each other? Or, are there any loops in my network? Or, why my network is super slow? So, we did, uh, uh, survey on nano trading list about uh, a few months ago and uh, we asked the network administrator to share with us uh, some of their insight about uh, operating and debugging network. Uh, in particular, one of the questions that we asked was uh, to tell us about the most frequently seen problem uh, in their networks. And uh, among the 61 respondents, 57% 50, uh, of them uh, said that the reliability issues that directly relate to the first three questions are among the top seen problems in their network. 53% uh, indicated that latency with this uh, answer to this last question is uh, one of the uh, major issues. About 18% believe that uh, security policy violation is a major issue and 10% said forward. So you can see the problems that they face day to day is actually directly translated to answer these questions that I uh, mentioned. 
But why is it hard to answer those questions? There are several reasons for that. One is that networks are getting larger, so we have to manage more ports and more switches. Network functionality is getting more complex. With over 6,000 RFCs that define today, it's not unusual to see some of these mechanisms and protocols that are listed here to be deployed in a network that, that we use every day. Also, debugging tools are really simple and, and rudimentary. In the same survey, when we asked the network admins to tell us about the tools that they use most often for network debugging, in trace and are one of the mostly used uh, tools. But I believe the essence of the problem is the way that forwarding state is written in, in the network inboxes. So the forwarding state consists of a set of rules, forwarding rules, that are installed in the forwarding tables of uh, switches, routers, and other boxes in the network that decide how an incoming packet is processed by the box and sent to the uh, output box. So this forwarding uh, entries or, or forwarding state is written into networking boxes through local instances of protocols running locally on a, on a switch by a remote instance of the same protocol running on all uh, other boxes in the network, by local and remote instances of, of different protocols also running in the network, manually by different network administrators, and even by network administrator that left the, uh, the company and no longer. So as you can see, this forwarding state is not constructed in a way uh, that lends itself well to, uh, to verification and checking. And as a result, the best practice for, uh, for debugging network is to probe this state by sending uh, pin packets. But I believe if we can uh, provide an abstraction for this, uh, for this forwarding state, then we can uh, create tools that actually formally verify the network and operate the network correctly at all the time. And uh, that's, the, that's my thesis goal. So first, I want to define a simple and protocol independent abstraction model for forwarding functionality of network. And then I want to use that to develop a set of solid, simple, and protocol independent tools for analyzing, monitoring, and debugging the network. So uh, the outline of my talk is as follows. I start by introducing this error space analysis framework which is this abstraction model for forwarding functionality of network. Then I will use it to develop algorithms for finding reachability, detecting loop, and checking isolation of slices in the network. And then I will use this framework to develop some practical tools. Uh, I will talk about three tools. Uh, Hassle, which is an offline checking tool for control plane of network. Netplumber, which is an online checking tool for the control plane of network. And ATPG, which is an online checking tool uh, for, for data plane. And I will show uh, runtime examples of, of these uh, uh, three tools on three uh, networks, Internet 2, Stanford Backbone, and Google WAN network. So the bulk of this talk is based on a paper that was published in uh, NSCI 2012. Net Network piece is based on a paper we submitted to, to NSCI 2013. And the ATPG part is based on a paper that will appear in Cornex 2012 in a couple of weeks. So, to get some insight of how we can uh, abstract complexity in a complex system, let's look at other fields and see how they, they tackle uh, similar problems. In particular, I want to look at the field of communication system because they have a kind of similar problem that they, they want to solve. So, given a complex system that consists of many different components, uh, frequency modulator, antenna, bandpass filter, and amplifier, and so on, we are interested to find out how a source signal is received at the destination. And the way that communication engineers solve this problem is first by finding the Fourier transform for this source signal. And by doing that, first of all, they find a simple representation of this source signal, regardless of the, uh, the time characteristic of the signal. And second, they can abstract away the properties of this signal. So it doesn't matter whether the, the source signal is, uh, is uh, voice or data or video, they all have a, a simple representation. And then they model each component in the system using uh, its transfer function, uh, which is, again, simple to use and also abstract away the complexity of all these components. So they all look like the same when they have uh, the transfer functions. So inspired by this, uh, I want to create this header space uh, uh, framework. And this is kind of the essence, the essence of what will follow in, uh, throughout my talk. So the first step in building this framework is to model a packet based on its uh, header bits as a point in a space that has L dimension. Each dimension is either 0 or 1, which we call the headers. 
So we look at the bits in the packet header as a flag sequence of zeros and ones. We don't care whether these 32 bits are IP source or IP destination. They're just zeros and ones, and we map each point to one dimension in that uh, in that space. So based on that, this packet header will be this point in the in the space. I'm just trying to be dimensional because of yeah, obvious reason. <laughs> Here, uh, the L should be uh, chosen long enough so that all the packet header bits that we really care about is contained within that L. So if you are analyzing a layer three network, then L will be all the way up to layer three. If you have deep packet ins inspection middle boxes, then L will be the, the, the entire length of the packet. Also, a flow will be represented by a region because flow has some wildcard bits in it and it corresponds to a set of uh, points in that region. The second step in, in building this framework is to model all networking boxes as transformer of header space. Here I'm showing a simple packet forwarding element that has uh, key ports here, and on each port I'm showing the header space for packets on that port. So uh, we know that the behavior of this packet forwarding element can be represented by a set of rules. And each rule basically consists of a match and an action. The match telling us what are the packet headers that are affected by this rule, and the action tells us how those packets will be transformed to the, uh, to the output port. So the match corresponds to a region in the input header space, and the action basically tells us how that region is transformed to a region in the output header space. Also, if you have more rules in the box, you will have more of these match regions that are transformed to a, uh, to a region in the output. So when a packet comes, we find out which of those match regions the packet belongs to and use the transformation to send the packet from out to port and here the packet goes out from that. So this shows that the behavior of this box can be modeled by a transfer function uh, that accept a header and, and port as the input. That's the, the header of the input packet and the input port that the packet is received from and generate a set of headers and ports as the output. And uh, the reason that we have a set at the output is that we want to be able to model uh, broadcasting or multicasting where one packet comes and many packets goes out of the box. So let's look at uh, one example. If you want to model the, the forwarding behavior of an IPv4 router, all we need to do is to look at the forwarding <coughs> table of that router. If this destination is sent on port 1, then we'll have a line in the transfer function that says send set packets uh, that has destination IP of H equal to this on port 1. And this destination IP of H is uh, a simple uh, way to refer to those 32 bits that correspond to the uh, to destination IP address, that happen to be the destination IP address. Uh, if you have more forwarding rules, we'll just add uh, more lines to the transfer. Then if you want to uh, model the TTL decrement of, uh, of this uh, or DD4 router, we just add that action here in the action part. And even if you want to model uh, the map rewriting part, we just add more action at the output. Let's look at some uh, more realistic uh, uh, action to see, to see how we can actually implement uh, uh, these, these actions. So for example, a rewrite action that's rewrite with 0 to 2 with value 1, 0, 1 can be modeled by an AND that basically clear out these that first three bits and then already with 101 to, uh, to rewrite those values. Uh, or an encapsulation action that can encapsulate packet in a 1010 header should shift the header by four bits to the, uh, to the right and then already with 1010 to rewrite those bits at the beginning. Decapsulation is the opposite action, just uh, shift to the left. Uh, a TTL decrement action looks at those eight bits that correspond to the TTL if they are zero, drops the packet. If it's more than zero, then uh, reduce it by one. And uh, a load balancing action basically sends the packet out on all the uh, outgoing ports unmodified. And the reason that we send it to, the, to all these outgoing ports is that we want to explore all possible uh, output paths. So, one important property of uh, transfer function is that we can compose them. And uh, by composing transfer function, we can find end-to-end -end behavior of them. So over here, I'm showing a simple example consisting of three boxes. And I'm interested to see how the packet at the input of box R1 is, is propagated through the network. So I should apply the transfer function of box 1 and get the packet at the output. And then apply that output to the transfer function of box 2 and get the packet at the output of uh, R2. So the, the mathematical expression for this corresponds to trans, uh, the uh, composition of these two transfer functions. Anyway, if I want to go one talk further, I just keep applying these transfer functions to the result. So this shows that 
the behavior of this network from this input port to that output port can be represented by this black box that has this transfer function representation. The other property of transfer function is that we can invert them, and, and the inverse basically tells us all possible input packet headers that can generate an output packet header. Uh, I'm not going to uh, give you specific examples of how to find the inverse, but I, I just intuitively show you what, what does it mean to invert the transfer function. If you have these regions in the input header space that are mapped by transfer function to those uh, corresponding regions at the output header space of the box, then the inverse of transfer function effectively reverse uh, these two and map from these output header spaces to the input header space. And uh, because the transfer function itself wasn't uh, a function, it was a map actually, uh, it may be the case that one point here is, uh, is mapped to, to two points at the output, and that's perfectly fine. The, the inverse of transfer function is also another map in, in the strict mathematical terms. So the third step in, in building the header space framework is to develop a set algebra uh, to, to work uh, with, with header spaces. In particular, we want to be able to intersect, complement, and difference uh, two, uh, two regions within the header space and check subset and equality conditions on, on those regions. And uh, the reason that we are interested in doing this set operation is that, as, as you will see in the, in the rest of the talk, uh, at some point we want to check whether two slices of network are isolated or not, where at that point we need to intersect uh, two of those regions. Or when we checking uh, whether a loop is infinite or not, we, we should check whether uh, two regions of header space are subset of each other. So we need these operations in a way. And uh, every region in the header space can be described by a union of wildcard expression. So we can reduce the problem to actually check these operations on, on the wildcard expression. So if we can do this, this set operation on wildcard expression, then we can uh, subsequently do the same operations on, on header space regions. So uh, I, I focus on that. And in the interest of time, I'm only going to explain how to do intersection of wildcard expression. The other operations uh, are less used, uh, uh, but if you're interested, you can, uh, you can see the paper and, and see how, how we can go do that. So to do the intersection, the bit by bit intersect the two wildcard expression using this uh, wildcard expression uh, intersection table. So all this table is telling us is that for each pair of bits, what is the common value that those pair of bits can take? So a zero intersect with a zero will, will generate a zero because that's the common bit value. Uh, zero intersect with an x as a wild card will to result in a zero because wild card will have zero and one values. And a zero intersect with a one will result in an empty because there is no intersect. So uh, in this example, I'm intersecting one zero x x with one x x zero. I start from left to right, I intersect with one with one and get a one here. Zero with x get a zero here and x with x get an x here and so on. So by, by doing this operation bit by bit, I can intersect the uh, wild card. However, if I see only one z in there in the result, then the entire thing is empty. Uh, as an example, when intersecting these two wildcard expressions, I have a 1 and a 0 here, which result in a z. Therefore, the whole thing is empty. The reason is that these two wildcard expressions will, will, uh, will lay in two different planes in the, in the header space. Uh, so now that, that we have uh, introduced header space analysis, let's try to use that to develop some useful algorithms for, uh, for checking properties about the network. I want to uh, talk about these algorithms. The, the first one is finding reachability in network. I want to find out whether host A can host, uh, talk to host B, and if it can, what is the packet headers that A need to use uh, for this communication to happen. So to do that, I start by injecting a hypothetical OLX test packet header from A into the network. This all its test packet header is, uh, is a packet that has wildcard on all its bit position and it represents the set of entire possible packet headers that A can possibly generate. And I apply it into this virtual network. This is not the actual network. I, I take the uh, uh, one snapshot of the network, generate transfer function for all of these boxes, and then use those transfer functions to do the, the analysis. I don't actually inject any packets in, in, in the network. So I put this into the transfer function of box one, which uh, you know drop some part of those uh, those input regions and modify some parts, and we get uh, some of those regions pass through the transfer function into the output. Then I apply the result to the next round of transfer function to see how it passed through that transfer function, 
And finally, I go through the last transfer function until I, I got to the destination. At this point, I solved uh, the problem whether A can talk to B. It can, because some, some packet headers have, have reached all the way to the destination. And also, I find what the packet headers will look like at the destination side. Each of the points within these regions correspond to a packet header that, that will be reached uh, to the destination. The mathematical expression for, uh, for these regions uh, is kind of in, a, in a very interesting form. It corresponds to the union of two expressions. Each expression is the composition of transfer function along one of the paths that connect A to B. So we have one path that's going from 1 to 2 to 3, and 1 to 4 to 3, so we have two uh, uh, expressions here. And that's, that's what we expect uh, based on the, the composition of transfer function rule like I discussed before. Similarly, if we want to find out what the packet header will look like at the source side, we find what they look like at the destination side, uh, we can use the inverse transfer function technique to trace them back to the input. When we do that, we find out that these regions uh, are, are uh, the image of these regions at the, at the input. The idea here is that not every point within this all uh, packet header will survive all the way to B. Some of those points may get dropped along the way. Some of those points will uh, go to other destinations. But these highlighted points are, are the set of points that will be mapped to here. If all the uh, boxes have only you know, forward action and don't, don't modify the packet header, these two regions will, will look like the same at the source, but potentially we can have rewrite action and, and uh, those regions change here. The next algorithm that I want to discuss is finding loops in the network. Uh, again, the algorithm is, is very similar. We start by injecting an OLX test packet header from every switch port into, the, uh, into this virtual network. Uh, and follow the packet until it comes back to the injection port, at which point uh, we, we find the loops. Very simple. So I'm, I'm running again a, a cartoon example here. I'm injecting this OLX uh, packet header from this port into the box one. I need to repeat the process for, for all other uh, ports. So I'm, I'm doing it. I, I, the packet goes through <coughs> transfer function of box one, chain, chain. Then it goes through transfer function of box two. Again, uh, the shape is changing goes through transfer function of box 3. And uh, for the sake of this example, it happened to be the case that actually something uh, comes back to the injection port. So at, at this point, we say that, OK, we find the loop, because there are some points here in this old packet header that has gone through the loop and come back to the, to the injection port. However, the problem is that, are these points going to loop again in the, in the next round or not? And to solve that problem, we need to use the inverse transfer function technique again basically trace this small region back to its origin and find out what, what part of that original OLX packet that is actually generating it. So we call this orange region, the original header space, and the blue region, the return header space. The idea is that this original header space represents the entire set of uh, packet headers that would come from this port, go through the loop, and then come back to this port again, because we started by injecting the OLX packet header. And the answer to this question that whether uh, the packets will loop again or not depends on the situation of these two regions. If, they, if there was no intersection between these two regions, then the, the loop would be finite. Just consider any point within this uh, original header space. It goes through the loop and map back to a point here, which is outside that region. And remember, this region represents the entire set of packet headers that could loop, so the next round of the loop won't happen. However, if this, uh, this blue region was completely within the orange region, then the loop would be infinite. Again, taking any point within this orange region, after going to the loop, it's mapped back to a point in the blue region, which is, again, inside the orange region, so it can loop back in the next round as well. And if you have a partial intersection like this, we need to do more, uh, more work to uh, figure out whether the, uh, the loop is final or infinite. The idea here is that these points, out, these points in the blue region that are outside the orange region, they fall within this first category. So we can just focus on the intersection of this, uh, these two regions, which is this, uh, this smaller cube here. And for that, we can use the inverse transfer function again to find out what part of that original uh, orange region was generating this smaller region. And when we do that, we find that, okay, this is the region, so if the problem reduced to the first case, and we know that the loop is, in, is not uh, infinite. Uh, however, if we end up in the same uh, scenario again, we just keep repeating and repeating again, 
And uh, every time we, we repeat this process, the regions start shrinking and shrinking until they, they may end up being one of the first two cases or uh, reduced to n. Uh, the, the case of loops that are uh, taken care of by TTL, they pretty much fall within that uh, third category. So uh, the last uh, check that we want to develop here is checking isolation of slices. But first, we need to define what do we mean by, by a slice in the network. So a slice is defined by a tree, a topology consisting of a set of switches and routers that belong to that slice, and a set of predicates on packet headers that is controlled by that slice. So if we have a network like this, uh, and we want to create a VLAN slice on these uh, three boxes, uh, the, the, the definition of that VLAN slice will look like this, where this <coughs> corresponds to the predicates uh, for, uh, for a VLAN slice, which is VLAN equal to A on, on the packet header. This corresponds to a region in the, in, the, in the header space that defines that uh, predicate. And because the VLAN is stretched across these three boxes, we have one of these cubes on, on each of these uh, switches. Uh, but why do we care about isolation of slices? Uh, there, uh, there are many applications for that. I just uh, mentioned a couple of them here. Uh, for example, in the case of banks, uh, they may need it uh, for, for added security in their networks. Or a healthcare network may need it to comply with HIPAA, which requires that two uh, healthcare doesn't share patient reports with, with each other. Now back to the original question, how can we check if uh, two slices are isolated or not? Imagine we have another slice defined on the same network. The first thing that we need to check is that the slice definition don't intersect. And we can use the, the intersection operation from the, from the header space to make sure that these regions uh, don't intersect, which is the case uh, for, for this example here. The other check that we need to do is to make sure that packets don't leak from one slice uh, to the other, because it may be the case that the packet on VLAN A is written by VLAN forwarding to VLAN B and uh, leak to, uh, to, the, to the VLAN B slice. And to check for that, we need to apply the header space definition of each slice to the network transfer function and find the image of that slice under network transformation. So I'm doing it for the uh, blue slice here, and I find that the image of this blue slice under network transformation is this uh, you know, uh, dashed region. This shows how, the pack, how, how all the possible packets that belong to the uh, blue slice will be uh, forwarded after one top of forwarding. So we see over here that uh, the packets that belong to the blue slice on these spots can be forwarded to the next hub in two points in this region and has some intersection with the, uh, with the red slice. So we say that packets can actually be in this example. Before moving on, uh, let's recap what header space frameworks uh, do for us. Uh, it's as simple as I showed you, it's a simple abstraction that gives us a, cost, a common model for all the packets that can uh, traverse in the network through the header space uh, notion. A common model for forwarding behavior of all networking boxes uh, through transfer function notion. And uh, a mathematical foundation upon which we can uh, check uh, properties uh, through the network, and that's through the notion of transfer function, it's inverse and, uh, and a set of set operations on, on header space. So uh, now let's uh, see what kind of tools we can, uh, we can create using this uh, framework. And I want to start by introducing Hassel, which is a header stamp or a header space library. And it's an implementation of this uh, uh, header space framework. There are two versions uh, of Hassel, one in Python and one in C. Uh, the code consists of a foundation layer that implements header space and transfer function objects. And uh, then there's an application layer that uses this foundation layer uh, to do the reachability, loop detection, and slice isolation checks. And uh, the interesting observation here is that uh, all of these checks, less than uh, 100 lines of code on, on both of the implementations, uh, the, the idea here is that the, uh, that the uh, foundation layer gives such a powerful abstraction that uh, we can easily implement checks on top of it. Uh, so a lot of what you've talked about hinges on being able to find these inverses. <coughs> mm -hmm. So is that at all an issue, or is it? No, there's no issue. Is it just yeah, straightforward. Right. I just don't show the, the implementation in terms of time. Yeah, it's, it's easy to find. It's conceptually just reversing the, the input and output. 
So uh, the, the, the hassle also comes with the parser that's only implemented in, in Python. Uh, the, the, the parser basically can, uh, can parse the CLI output uh, from Cisco IOS, Juniper Junos, and OpenFlow table dump and generate transfer functions from them. Uh, for example, in the case of uh, Cisco IOS, it can read the IP table, uh, R table, MAC table, uh, spanning tree output, and, and config files, and you know, compile them down to transfer functions that then we can use in our uh, analysis. Uh, and it also keeps track of which transfer function rule is based on which lines in the, in the CLI output. Uh, so in case of problems, we can trace it back to the actual configuration in the process. And uh, the code is also available at this URL if you're interested to see. So we tested uh, Hassle on a Stanford Backbone Network. Uh, it's the network that's connecting all the departments and uh, dorms together. Uh, as a little bit of background, Stanford owns 6 uh, 16 uh, IP domain, uh, and overall, uh, all of these boxes have 750 k IP forwarding rules, about 1.5k ACL rules. Uh, about 100 VLANs are defined in this network, and uh, VLAN forwarding is also enabled on these uh, uh, boxes. So we, we ran a loop detection test here, and to do that, I, I got a complete snapshot of the, of the network configuration through, uh, through one of the admins, Yuhan. Uh, I, I fed those uh, configuration into the hassle parser to generate the transfer function, and then used it to uh, run uh, the loop detection test. Uh, here I'm showing you one example that one example of problem we, we find. Uh, this shows the top of the spanning tree for red VLAN, and uh, this part shows the spanning tree for a, a blue VLAN on the, on the network. But I find that the packet on red VLAN had been broadcasted on the VLAN go all the way to the core router, where the core router rewrite the VLAN ID to the uh, uh, to the blue when it comes back to the that uh, router down here. The VLAN is again rewritten to red and then it gets broadcasted on the red VLAN again and again. So the packet basically goes from red to the blue VLAN back and forth. And uh, spanning tree, uh, which is a protocol that is designed to make networks loop free, uh, is actually <coughs> causing a loop by, by inappropriate interaction of two, two instances. Uh, just a small note on performance of, uh, of this tool on Stanford network. So uh, generating transfer functions uh, using I only use a laptop that has a single uh, quad core uh, CPU and 4 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, on that, generating transfer function takes about 150 seconds to complete. Uh, and completing a pairwise reachability on average takes 40 milliseconds with a mean of uh, 1 and max of uh, 500 milliseconds. And the, the loop detection uh, test uh, on, on 30 cores takes about 2 seconds to complete. And that's based on the hassle implementation and uh, with, with multi -trend. Uh, just a small note of uh, how these things scale. Uh, so the, the scalability of reachability algorithm is dr square and loop detection is p dr square, where d is the diameter of the network, the, the maximum number of hops that packets can traverse in the network, r is the maximum number of rules in a switch, and p is the number of ports that inject the packet from in the case of loop detection algorithm. So if tomorrow Stanford decides to acquire three more campuses and build a network and connect them using this structure, <laughs> then uh, the hassle toolkit could still run this network. Reachability will increase to 100 milliseconds and loop to 20 seconds. And if uh, further Stanford double the number of rules that uh, exist uh, in this network, then uh, the, the performance will be something like this: less than a uh, less, less than half a millisecond for uh, less than half a second for reachability and 80 seconds for uh, uh, loop detection. So Hassel uh, is a good tool for offline static checking analysis. It take, however, it takes several seconds to collect all the states, parse them, generate transfer function, and then uh, run the test. The next challenge is how to make it real time. So as the churn is happening in the network, we want to be able to verify that okay, the, the, the policies, uh, the design policy of the network has been uh, satisfied. And uh, one solution for that is to rerun the analysis every time a uh, network changes. However, there are, there are several drawbacks for that. One is that collecting all the state from all these boxes is slow and wasteful. It takes a lot of resources just to read that data out of, uh, out of the boxes. 
The other problem is that redoing all this computation is kind of inefficient. When only a small change happened in the network, you could potentially use some of the computation that you have done uh, just to update the results. <coughs> and that's the motivation for the ne next tool I'm going to introduce, which is called Netromance. So as I mentioned, there are two challenges. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, collecting the forwarding states, uh, and the other one is updating the check results in, in real time. Uh, Software-defined networks provide a nice way to, uh, to check for that uh, first property. Uh, if you look at the interface between the controller and the switches, it's a logically centralized location to observe all the state changes that happen in the network. We can see all the installation of rules, removal of rules, or link up, link down events that happen just by tapping into that uh, uh, communication. And uh, so for the rest of this talk, I assume I have access to a stream of uh, state changes that happen in the network, and I focus on this second challenge, which is updating the check results in real time. So the system that I built is called NetLumber. It's a system that sits between the controller and the switches and listen to that communication and try to verify every state changes with network policies. But before we proceed, uh, I, I need to uh, make a point here that most policy and invariants can be expressed in terms of reachability. Uh, as we see in, in my talk, uh, loop freedom is reachability plus some uh, extra stuff. And most other policies like checking black holes or isolation of hosts or making sure that some communication is happening via middle hosts or maximum hot count in network all are, uh, can, can be described by some variety of, of reachability analysis. So uh, I really focus on computing reachability incrementally and really fast. Uh, and the key idea to do that is to reuse computation as, as much as possible. So the system that I built is called uh, NetPlumber. It's it creates a virtual dependency graph of all the uh, rules that exist in the network and use it to compute reachability. In that graph, nodes are corresponding to forwarding rules in the network, and uh, directed edges uh, correspond to next hop dependency of rules. Meaning that I say there is, an, there is a directed edge from rule R1 to R2. If in the physical network there is a physical uh, link from switch 1 to switch 2, and also the output header space of R1 has some intersection with input header space of R2. Basically what it's saying is that there exists at least one packet that can be processed by root R1 and then followed into uh, root R2. So to understand uh, how NetGummer works, let's uh, run through uh, one example. Imagine you have a simple network uh, consisting of uh, these four switches. I look at the, the, config, the, the forwarding table of each of those switches, and for each rule, I, I put a node in the, in the net plumber graph, which I call the plumbing uh, network or plumbing graph. And uh, then I need to create directed edges between these uh, uh, nodes in the, in the graph. I use uh, that intuition. Here, there is a directed edge from this uh, top loop to the top green node because there is a link here. And the output header space of this has some intersection with the input header space of this. Similarly, if I look at all other nodes in the network, I can create these other direct edges and, and, and create this uh, graph. Also, uh, each rule in the net plumber keeps keep track of all the higher priority rules within the same table whose input header space has some intersection uh, with, with itself. So uh, the idea here is that the higher priority rules have precedence in processing uh, packets that would otherwise match on the lower priority rules. So we need to keep track of that, uh, and you will see how, how we use that in, in, in the next slides. Now we can use this structure to, uh, to compute reachability. Let's say we want to compute reachability from A to B. Uh, all we need to do is to connect a source node uh, in the place of uh, node A here, and a fork node in the place of node B, the job of source node is to inject flow into this virtual graph of uh, uh, net plumber. Uh, uh, again, I, I want to mention that we are not sending any packets in the network. This is uh, a virtual instance of the network, and, and we just use it for, uh, for computational purposes. So uh, this OLX packet will go through that, uh, those boxes and get transformed uh, by the rules and uh, just get propagated <coughs> into the network. You observe that. They own these uh, regions only trans uh, only transferred along these directed edges that show how the packet can go from uh, one rule to the other. 
And uh, as these packets are traversing, I also uh, keep a pointer uh, from the next uh, flow, the, uh, from each flow to the next flow, to see the history of flows as it uh, as it travels through the net plumber track. Now, uh, the computing reachability was something that we could have done before. But the real power of net plumber is to update reachability results in uh, in real time. So imagine I add a new rule here to this uh, dream box. First, I need to create these uh, directed edges to connect this new rule to the other uh, part of the net plumber graph. I also need to create uh, these inter-table influences of rules, because there is one here. And now we can get the flow from this box, process it through uh, the green rule up to here, and then send this back uh, to the network and all the way uh, to the code. And uh, at that point, we have done part of the uh, update. The other part is that there is a link, there is an intertable dependency link, link between these two uh, green rules. And as you can see, the packet that match on 100x will now uh, match up, that, that were previously matching on this second rule will now match on this first rule, because it's in higher priority. So we need to update these flows that's going through this uh, down path here. And to update that, they will probably reduce because they are no, no longer matching on, on, the, on those paths. But it reduces like this, and at that point we have the, the updated uh, So uh, the, the, the real power of probe mode is not just getting uh, flows uh, at, at some point in the network, they can actually check policy uh, on those flows. So for example, if you wanted to check this policy that says packets with header 1001 to server should pass through the green box, probe mode can, can check that policy because it has access to all the flows here and it can use these uh, history links to trace it back and see, okay, the 1001 uh, header is actually coming from this path that's passing through the uh, green box. And uh, the policy is actually very fine in this case. Imagine at some point, somebody decided to remove that uh, rule uh, on top of blue box. Again, uh, NetPlumber can easily update the result by first removing the flow that's going through this path that the blue uh, loop was, was part of that path. And also because there is an intertable dependency here, uh, those packets that were previously going through this blue loop will now go through this uh, bottom path and uh, they will go through this route. So we need to update these flows and add those uh, to this bottom path. And now we can remove this safely from the, uh, from the net plumber path. But at that point, the policy is violated and the problem node gets angry at us. Uh, now let's look at a couple of uh, examples to see how, how we can uh, do more complicated policy checking with, with NetPlumber. So imagine we have a graph like this, whose plumbing network is this complex uh, uh, graph. It's obviously much more complex than the, than the actual network because nodes here corresponds to root in, in the actual network. Now imagine we want to check the policy that guests cannot access server S, and we have two guests here and a server here. Uh, to check this policy, we, we connect two source nodes in the place of these uh, two guests here. So this corresponds to this, this corresponds to this. And I connect the probe node in the place of server, and I program the server to look at all the flows that it's receiving and making sure that none of those are actually coming from these two uh, source nodes. Or even a more complex policy that says HTTP and HTTPS traffic from server S to client C doesn't share the same path. All I need to do for that is to connect again two source nodes in the place of this server, one generating HTTP and one generating HTTPS traffic, and have a probe node here that makes sure that the HTTP and HTTPS traffic that it's receiving are not coming from the same path. That's, that's equivalent to checking the policy. The other question is that how can we uh, distribute NetPlumber to uh, improve its performance and scale to, uh, to larger network, and if it's possible? The answer is that yes, we can, we can do that, and the idea for doing that is by slicing network based on forwarding equivalent classes. So if you look at a typical net plumber graph, it will look like this. There are clusters of highly connected rules, and there are some rules that are violating this perfect clustering condition. So you can imagine in the case of an IPv4 router, this corresponds to uh, rules that are processing one subnet, this corresponds to rules that are processing another subnet, there are some default or aggregate rules that are in interacting with both of these, basically processing packets that belong to both of these. 
So uh, the way that we can uh, distribute the load is by chopping off this network along these uh, uh, cluster boundaries and assign each uh, smaller net plumber graph to one instance, and that can be run uh, you know, independently from, from the other instances and can probably faster. And those rules that are violating the clustering condition should be replicated on both, both of the instances. And then uh, basically the, the final result is the aggregation of the results uh, that are observed by this probe node at the this cluster. If a violation happens in any of these clusters, then that's a violation for the network. So I implemented NetPlumber in, uh, in C++. It uses uh, the foundation layer of Hassle C uh, as its base. And the structure basically looks like this. There's a NetPlumber manager layer. That, that's basically creating the, the net plumber graph and managing the rule node, code node, and source nodes. And it provides an API uh, for adding, adding or removing a rule in, in the net plumber graph, an API for adding and removing links in the net plumber graph. And you can, you can imagine these two API are, are useful to update net plumber as changes happen in the net. <coughs> uh, there is an API for adding and removing source node and adding and removing we can use them to implement new policies in the, in the net plumber. And this API also enables us to program the probe node to, to check for the policy that we actually want, and also set a, a callback function in this probe node so that one, when a first policy violation happens, that callback function is called and we can respond to that uh, uh, violation. And also there is a callback function for loops that happen in the net plumber. So I, I experimented with NetPlumber on Google WAN network. Uh, this is the topology of Google WAN. Uh, it's, it's a network that's connecting the data centers of Google across the world. And it's the largest deployed SDN that's 100% open flow. And uh, the data center effectively handing off of uh, these uh, switches at the, uh, at the edge. And overall, there are 160K open flow rules that are installed in, in, in this network. So uh, the policy that I checked on, on Google One is to, to make sure that uh, all 52 edge switches can talk to each other. That's, that corresponds to uh, communication between all the data centers that, that uh, Google owns. This translates to about a 2,500 pay-wise reachability check. And uh, to do that, in the equivalent net plumber graph, I connect a source node and a probe node to each of these edge switches program the source node to send all its packets into the net plumber graph <coughs> and uh, the probe node to receive those packets and make sure that it's receiving packets from uh, basically receiving flows from all other uh, uh, source nodes I use two snapshots of the network that are taken six weeks apart uh, the, the uh, administrator for, for this network gave me a complete dump of the uh, open flow rules and uh, I, I used a parser to basically parse them into uh, a transfer function of the node. Uh, I use the first snapshot to create the initial net plumber uh, state. So net plumber should be initialized by one of the rules that already exist in the network, which takes about 34 seconds. And then I use the, the diff of the two uh, snapshots as sequential update that I fit into the net plumber. And I, I measure the update time for each of those changes that, that happened in the network. Uh, this graph shows the runtime. Uh, the x-axis is runtime in milliseconds, it's a log uh, axis, and the y-axis is the CDF of uh, runtime. It shows that for 60% uh, for of rule with only a single instance of net plumber, uh, it takes less than one millisecond to update the, the, this, this huge policy check. And uh, about 95% uh, of rule will be uh, checked in less than uh, 10 milliseconds. These rules that takes uh, much longer are the default or aggregate rules in the network because adding or removing them in the net plumber requires a lot of changes, a lot of you know, uh, directed edges to be created and flows should be routed and so on. However, if you wanted to do the same check using Hassle, meaning that get a complete snapshot, process it, and, and you know, fit it into Hassle and, and so on, it would be a point further down here, is, uh, on more than uh, 100 seconds to complete. Another interesting observation is the way that uh, adding more instances or clustering net plumber will, will work. Uh, this table show, shows how the runtime, the mean and median of runtime is changing after we go from one instance up to eight instances. And as you can see, after five instances, we are not really getting much more benefit. The reason for that is that 
you remember that the net, the net on our graph, there was clusters. And if we actually do the clustering on, on those uh, actual cluster boundaries, then we get most of the benefit. Going beyond that, we are essentially replicating all the rules across all the clusters. So the two clusters that will be result from this will not have uh, any more, uh, I mean, any less uh, rules, and so the, the runtime will be effectively the same. Uh, as another uh, benchmarking experiment, on, I, I ran a similar uh, reachability check, but I just did one, one pair of that to see how one pair will, will react on different networks. I, I repeat the same process on sample and internet too, and you can see that the average terrible update time is well less than uh, one millisecond on all of these networks. But the case of internet too is a little bit higher because there are much more rules in, in each of those uh, boxes. So, uh, NetFlower and Hassle both designed to find problems uh, in the control plane. However, what will happen if a switch or link goes down, or a link is congested, or an ASIC or hardware uh, is, is broken? There's no way that such tools can detect that. Uh, the, only, the only way to detect this sort of data plane, uh, data plane problem is at the runtime of the network, through either active testing or passive monitoring that packets that are actually running in the network. And uh, that's the motivation for, the, uh, for this last tool, which is called ATPG. So the ATPG, or Automatic Test Packet Generation Framework, has, has this goal. We want to monitor the data plane by sending test packets in the network <coughs> to achieve maximum rule coverage, just in the same way that uh, a good software test suite will try to exercise every rule in the software program by at least one of those test suites, uh, in the same way, we try to send at least one test packet that exercises uh, each of those rules. And we want to achieve the minimum number of such test packets in the network. And uh, we also want to be able to handle constraints on the terminal ports from which we can send packets in the network, and also constraints on, uh, on the headers of those test packets that we use uh, the network, because we may not be able to send any packet that we want uh, for, for obvious reasons. Uh, and once an error is detected, we want to be able to localize that error. So I just uh, uh, tell you about the algorithm sketch of ATPG here. Uh, if you're interested, you can, uh, you can refer to the paper. So the algorithm is as follows. We start by, uh, by using HSA to find reachability between all the uh, <coughs> terminals that we have, between all pair of, uh, those terminals. And in the process, we find all the forwarding equivalent classes. Then we pick a sample test, uh, test packet for each forwarding equivalent class. And then use a mean set cover algorithm to, to choose a set of those uh, sample test packets whose rule coverage corresponds to the entire set of rules in the network. As I mentioned, I can refer to this paper if you're interested in details. Uh, but how many packets is, is needed for, uh, for doing uh, such uh, uh, coverage? The idea here is that the number of packets scales uh, roughly with the number of formally equivalent classes in the network, which is proportional to the number of unique subnets that we care about <coughs> in the network. So in the case of standard backbone network with, with 16 routers, 4,000 packets was enough. In the case of Internet 2 with 9 routers, 30,000 packets was enough. And even if you wanted to test all the rules 10 times per second, this requires less than 1% of link bandwidth. We had a small implementation of ATPG on Gates, Packard, and, and CIS uh, network that uh, constantly sending test packet uh, here. And coincidentally, at the time that we received this email uh, that says network was down as a result of the loop, we were running actually uh, ATPG. And this is the, the number of pages per minute over time. You can see around uh, 620 to 7 kicks the number of pages per minute uh, kick here. And, it, and, and we can use uh, ATPG to actually localize the affected area and find uh, where, where the problem is happening. Before I finish my talk, I want to zoom out a little bit uh, to show you the bigger picture. As a network admin, I have a set of policies that I want to implement in my network. And that's the job of the control plane logic to translate those rules, uh, those policies into rules that are getting installed in the, in the switches or routers at the forwarding state of the network. The job of header space analysis to model this forwarding behavior based on these rules. And then Hassel and NetPlumber try to verify equivalence of policy and these rules based on this view that headspace analysis is providing to it. 
And ATP did try to verify the actual data plane behavior by generating test packet based on this view that had a space analysis problem. <coughs> so it, the, the whole framework uh, pro provide coverage for both the control plane and, and data plane. Before I conclude, uh, I want to mention some of the related works uh, here, because little bits and pieces of uh, HSA can be found uh, in the literature. So uh, in the geometric packet classification works, uh, you can see that the ideas of uh, geometric representation for, for packet headers. Uh, but the main difference with HSA is that uh, they use uh, protocol fields as, as axes or uh, dimensions of the space. So HSA that uses each bit as a dimension uh, that allows it to, to be uh, protocol agnostic. The axiomatic basic of uh, communication in SICOM 2007 uh, it, it also have an equivalent definition for, uh, for packets and packet forwarding uh, in the network. However, they didn't, uh, because they, their goal was to verify protocols and, and not network debugging, they didn't provide any algorithms for network debugging or any tools for that. Uh, these two other papers uh, actually present some uh, algorithms for finding reachability, but again, the algorithms are uh, protocol dependent, they are for IPv4, and also, it's just for reachability. They, they don't uh, give any insight into how to build uh, other checks and, and so on. Uh, and uh, finally, the ant, uh, there's, there's one more. Uh, the ant eater uh, system in SICOM uh, 2011 has similar goals as, as hassle to, to do some checks on the network. However, again, this is uh, protocol uh, dependent. And also, uh, it's about two to three order of magnitude slower than the C-based implementation of Haskell. Uh, it uses uh, SAT equations to, uh, to verify uh, uh, properties about the network. And uh, as, as, uh, as it uses SAT solver, it can only give one example or counter example when a failure happened uh, in the network, uh, versus uh, HSA that can give all the example and counter example. And uh, finally, Veriflow has uh, similar goals as NetPlumber. Uh, however, again, this is protocol dependent, and further, it can only handle uh, IP destination uh, rule. And uh, it can only also handle a forwarding rule versus HSA that can do any type of rule and also any, any type of action. So uh, header space analysis uh, over, over all of this has this advantage that's the first solution that's protocol independent, fast and practical, and can be used as basis for building many more uh, tools. There are also uh, a lot of complementary uh, uh, work that, that is required, along with HSA, uh, to, to create this ecosystem for network debugging. Just to list uh, some of those, uh, those works here, and if you're interested, you can uh, refer to that. So uh, I want to summarize my uh, talk at this point. Uh, I started by introducing header space analysis as a simple abstraction model for forwarding functionality of uh, all networking boxes. Uh, that gives us a common model for all packets, a common uh, model for forwarding functionality of all boxes, and a mathematical foundation upon which we can create uh, uh, algorithms for checking them. I use HSA uh, to develop algorithms for finding reachability, checking loop, and checking isolation of slices. Uh, I use it to develop a tool for real-time policy checking, and another tool for uh, automatically generating test packet to achieve maximum coverage with minimum number of test packets. I show how uh, a solid theoretical foundation on, on the way that uh, forwarding functionality of network works can lead to practical implementation that uh, change the way that we design and operate networks. Before I finish, I want to thank uh, a few people here. I want to start by thanking uh, David Dill for uh, agreeing to be the chair of my committee. David, I'm uh, also thankful to you for all the helps you did in, uh, for me to understand uh, the, the formal verification stuff and uh, try on, on networking. I want to thank uh, Scott, uh, who agreed to be on the committee in the last minute call and uh, driving all the way from Berkeley in this uh, rain. Also, sorry, Scott, that we didn't have any chocolate. <laughs> you know, you know. I, I live in Palo Alto, so you have a lot less to thank me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to uh, thank uh, Sachin uh, for being on my committee. Sachin, unfortunately, we didn't have a chance to collaborate closely, but I'm looking forward to uh, future opportunities for that. 
I also uh, want uh, to thank Guru. Uh, Guru, during the past uh, five years, uh, I, I enjoyed all of our talks and communication with each other, learned a lot from you, and, and uh, I, I really appreciate that. I also want to thank uh, Balaji for, uh, for agreeing to be uh, on, on my committee. Uh, Balaji, I'm also thankful to you for, uh, for all the things that I learned from you through the classes and interaction with the uh, students in your group. Also, thank you for being in the reading committee. I know your time is really uh, valuable and I appreciate it a lot. I also want to thank George Ragus, who uh, couldn't unfortunately come here today. But a lot of work that you see today is not possible without uh, his help. Is this really energetic and fun guy that always gives you uh, ideas, inspiration, at the same time criticism for, for, for your work? And I'm really thankful to him. I also want to thank my advisor, Nick. <laughs> Six years ago, when I was uh, interviewing at uh, US Embassy to get my visa and come here, the, the officer asked me uh, who will be your potential advisor. I only give one name, uh, Nick McKinnon. Nick, I'm thankful for giving me the chance to work with you during the past six years and providing a, a really a great PhD experience for me that's far beyond what I could uh, imagine and wish for. Uh, uh, Nick, I think for me and for many uh, people in the group, you're, you're a true friend and uh, an inspirational figure. I also want to thank my co-authors uh, James and Michael for their help with the ATPG and NetPlumber work, uh, my mentors at Google and, uh, and Ericsson, Scott White and, and James Kemp, uh, and uh, all the students in the group, all the students, postdocs and visitors in the group, I learned from uh, each of you uh, during, my, uh, during my PhD and all your feedback and comments made my papers and thoughts uh, look much better. Mm -hmm. I also want to thank uh, Persian Student Association at Stanford, uh, who uh, some, of, some of the people are actually coming here. Uh, without you guys, it wouldn't uh, be the same, my experience at Stanford away from home. I also want uh, to thank my parents and my brother for all the uh, help and support uh, during these years. Uh, and last but not least, uh, I want to thank my wife, Roya. Uh, if I want to summarize my life in the past six years, this would be a great summary. Stanford in the background and, and hair uh, at the front. Uh, so I want to thank you for all the uh, love and care you gave me during these years. And finally, I want to thank you all for uh, coming to my team.